Good morning. Welcome to Church by the Sea. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, and hey, inside your program is a connection card. If you'd take a moment to fill it out, especially if you're a first-time guest, if you would do that, we promise we're not going to show up for lunch today. We know when you're eating at your house, but we'd just love to say hello and introduce ourselves to you. So if you do that, you can put this into the offering plate when it comes by or in any of our generosity boxes, which are posted on the wall near the exits. <clears throat> this is a great way to share any prayer requests that you would like our prayer team to pray with you about or sign up for any event. Use these. It's a great way to communicate with us. Also, uh, we have this form inside your program. If you're interested in purchasing a poinsettia flower, we're going to have a number of them delivered. Uh, you may do that, and you can take the money, <clears throat> either put it in with this in an envelope, or you can go over to, I think, over to the uh, children's area. And also, the children's area, are, they're raising money for their ministry, and every year they sell these calendars. So if you would like a 2018 calendar, they're on sale two for 15 or $8 each, but it's a way that our children's ministry helps raise some funds, and uh, it's been successful every year. So if you're interested in a calendar for your wall, go see them over there, straight out through the, um, over there in the children's area. And let me say this, I hope that you guys, some of you were here Sunday evening last week. It was a blast. And uh, it's, we had the lighting of the Christmas tree, but we had people bring chili and macaroni and cheese, and some healthy people brought some lettuce and salads and those kind of things. But, man, we just had a blast from 5 to 6, and then we came out here and we lit the tree and sang some Christmas carols. And then there were Christmas desserts afterwards, and we all went back there for another, like, 45 minutes. So it was a really fun night. Mark it on your calendars for next year. Whenever you hear about the Christmas tree lighting, you don't want to miss it. And uh, a couple of things that we have happening here, we'd love for you to come join us. Next Sunday evening, our children are putting on a Christmas program. And I got to see their rehearsal yesterday. We have angels and other actors, and <laughs> it's going to be great, certainly entertaining, and you might even enjoy their singing. So it's going to be a fun night. It's next Sunday evening at 630 and also, if you're on, um, if you grab one of the angel tree things, uh, or the ornaments, we need the gifts returned today because they have to be delivered. So you can buzz home and get them after the service, and we'll make sure. Just let us know, okay? We'll get up with you. And uh, if you're on social media of any kind, Facebook, Instagram, please feel free to check in or take pictures and post them. It's a, just a great way to let people know where you go to church and help uh, perhaps invite some friends to come. So I hope you'll do that. And if you would, let's stand up and greet each other, say hello, give some handshake. We got some awesome people around you. I want you to get to know them. Maybe seated for a moment. This is the Advent season. Advent in the Christian calendar is just, it's, it's a time for us to reflect and really anticipate the coming of the Savior. You know, back in the Old Testament days, they kept looking forward and kept looking forward and looking forward to the arrival of our Savior. And uh, that's what Christmas is all about. And today, we look forward to God continuing to save us in our life, like, though We've embraced him as our savior. We don't have to worry about our sin. Like, that's handled and forgiven. But there's still work that God does in us. And so we look forward, like, God, help me now. I need you. And then also looking forward to the second coming of Christ, where he takes care of the rest of the story. So, uh, but we're going to light these candles. And last week, if you remember, we lit, the first week is all about hope. That because Christ came, we can have hope. Before he did, you know, we were on our own. We, we, could try really hard to live the kind of life that God would want. But, you know, we really need him. We need him to transform us because none of us are that good, that we're good enough for God. And so he took care of that. And then also, too, this week is all about the peace that we have because of Christ coming and really changing everything in our life. So join me for our opening prayer, please. <clears throat> God, we pause and we just say thank you. Humbly, God, we say, you know, we get to worship you and tell you that you're great. And that's not new news to you. But, Lord, sometimes we need to remind ourselves that you are great. You are capable. And, God, you're faithful. 
You know, we, can, we don't have an idea of what true faithfulness means. But Lord, you have been that to us. Thank you, God, that even when we were even unaware of how big a mess we were and in a broken relationship with you, that you had the plan all along to send a Savior. And God, through your graciousness towards us and your love, your affection, and even in your justice, you sent him. That would change the story for all of us. And God, we want to celebrate that because without you intercepting our life, giving us your grace and changing us, man, we'd be in a really big mess. Thank you. Thank you for the peace that we have, knowing that you got the story under control, even our story. And Lord, we just submit to that. Be this time, be with us in this time, and Lord, um, though you promise you always will, you always say that when there's two or more gathered, you're there in a unique way. So Jesus, we celebrate your presence, and we sing now to you. We listen to your word with great attention. And God, we're asking that your Holy Spirit would impress upon us, Lord. What's our next step? What do you want to do in our life that we may fully cooperate with your plan and your purpose for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing. Hark the herald angels sing. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth. In mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold him come, offspring of the favored one, veiled in flesh the Godhead sees, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as men with Sorry, man, you well. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with
marvelous light I'm running and out of darkness out of shame and by the cross you are the truth you are the life you are the way my dead heart now is beating my deepest stains now clean your breath fills up my lungs and now i'm free and now i'm free my dead heart now is beating my deepest stains now clean your breath fills up my lungs now i'm free and now i'm free sin has lost its power Death has lost its sting And from the grave you've risen Victoriously And into marvelous light I'm running and out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way Marvelous life, I'm a running and out of darkness, out of shame. By the cross, you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. Lift my hands and spin around to see the life that I have found. Oh, the marvelous life, the marvelous life. Lift my hands and spin around To see the light that I have found Oh, the marvelous light, the marvelous light and Sin has lost its power and Death has lost its sting and From the grave you've arisen Victoriously and into marvelous light, I'm a running and out of darkness, out of shame. And by the cross, you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. Forgiven because you were forsaken, and I'm accepted. You were condemned, and I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. You, my King, will die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. And I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken And I'm accepted You were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love My king would die for me. 
amazing love I know it's true It's my joy to honor you In all I do I honor you Jesus, you are my King Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be that you my King? Would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. I honor. If you would join me in prayer, we're going to be having our uh, offering here, so if you would get your gifts ready right after we pray. Lord, we love you, and thank you, God, for your faithfulness. And God, we just declare that our trust is in you. Thank you, Lord, that even in, in whatever circumstance, you can even create peace and even joy. So, Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to be our rescuer, the one who transforms us and changes us from sinner into saint amazing. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, guys, it's Christmas, right? We get excited about presents, don't we? There you go. <laughs> um, you know, what Christmas is all about is celebrating God's gift to us, and that's the arrival of our Savior, the Rescuer, right? We, we know that. If you've been in church, you know that's what it's a part and what it is. But it's the Savior who showed up that changed our story, the story of the world, but even our story. And how individually he makes a difference in our life. That's what Jesus came. And we'll see that. But let's just sort of take a step back for a moment and really look at what the culture has done. And I'm not a basher of the culture, but I just want us to be aware that it's easy to get caught and drawn away from what is the true significance of Christmas. Our culture has tried to reconstruct this whole season by removing the Christ, right? It's Christmas, but there's just no Jesus. And it's all about the gifts and the, you know, the songs and the traditions in a lot of ways. But they try to tell a story without having Jesus in the story. You know, the whole point is 
Jesus came. He's our rescuer. That's why we sing joy to the world. Because joy is possible when we know that God showed up and rescued us from ourselves, from other things. But our culture's designed something different. Let me show you. There was a survey done by the National, what used to be formerly known as the National Mental Health Association. It was uh, done 11 years ago, December 7th, 2006. And it talks about this new season. Again, it's really the result of having this Christmas season without Jesus in it, right? Getting caught up in the other things. Uh, the number one result was financial stress because of debt. Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> That's what it is. And how, you know, people dreaded the Christmas season, which, again, opposite of what Scripture tells us it's supposed to be about. But from there, it went on to how there was this overwhelming emptiness because of the memory of lost loved ones. Now, certainly, that's going to be sad, regardless of whether you have Christ or not. But without Christ and not knowing the story of, of Jesus and what he's done and what he's going to do still, there's just a deep emptiness. And so people are reflecting on their loss. And, and the next thing he talked about was how their schedule's so full because of all the parties and commitments and parades, just the stuff of the season. There's so much hustle and bustle. And then right after that was how they hate that the streets are so crowded and the stores are so crowded. And then after that was all about, somebody, the next two items were people talked about, again, overwhelming results because of this season culturally. Because they're, they're overwhelmed, they're depressed because of being alone. Right after that was people are depressed because they have to be with family. So, sorry, that's all of us, I guess, right? I mean, you got, you're, you're by yourself or you're with others, and okay. You know, that's the result. And then, well, then it talked a little bit more about internally, the stress, the loneliness. Not just lonely because you're alone, but you feel alone, empty. The anger, the depression, the overwhelming uncertainty about the future, anxiety because of, again, upcoming events and all this which led to destructive behaviors like overeating, overindulgence, over everything, overspending, <laughs> right? We could put in there. And the sleep disorders. So that's the culture's gift at Christmas. There you go. <laughs> Yay, right? It's easy to get caught up in that, isn't it? And I'm the first to tell you, I love new, shiny, fast, fun things. So I'm not standing up here as a person who's above it all. I'm with you, but I think it's important that for us, especially if you're in Christ, don't get caught up in what the culture has reconstructed and called Christmas. We got to stay true to what it is because it, it changes us. But the whole story about Christmas is that a story changer came and he showed up. So I, this morning, I'd just like to recall the story and then we're going to look at a passage in Ephesians of how because Jesus came, it makes a difference. So let's look at the passage and it'll be on the screen from Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Here the setting is an angel showed up. He's talking to Joseph. And Joseph just found out his uh, fiance is pregnant. And he knows it's not his and it shouldn't be anyone else's. And so he, he's a little disturbed. All right. And it says here, he considered this, Joseph. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And a great place for us right there is wherever you are, God's message is don't be afraid of your present circumstances or your future. You know, imagine the stuff going on inside of Joseph. Divorce uh, or pregnancy outside of marriage was a very a much bigger deal in that culture. Huge. And so he's just devastated. There are times when events, stories happen to us, we're devastated. They surprise us, knock our feet out from underneath us. But God's message is, I got this. If you're in Christ, God's going to work it out. So he goes on, uh, last part of 20. The Holy Spirit saying, For the child within her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Jesus literally means Yahweh saves. That's the Hebrew word for God. God saves. Then in verse 22, it says, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. And that's talking about Isaiah. Old Testament written 600 years before Jesus was born. And here's what it says. Again, the angel quotes it. He says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, 
which means God is with us. Man, that, the good news about Christmas is that God is with us. God showed up. You know, the, the angel didn't just drop down the first print of the Tampa Bay Times telling us about God. God himself showed up. God wearing an earth suit. And, and so it, it wasn't just saying, well, here's what you need to do. It's, here's the real hope. Here's the real rescuer. He didn't just say, well, good luck. I'm going to tell you how to do this or tell you here's the facts of the story. Good luck. Try to figure out how that applies to your life. Jesus showed up to apply it to us. And again, all we have to do is embrace it. And that's what the big story is. God didn't just tell us, be good. He sent a rescuer to us that would change us. It's the arrival of the story changer is here. Think of some bad decisions you've made in the past. Can you come up with one? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> All right. You've got them. There are times we wish we had a do-over, don't we? Have you noticed stupid shows up at just the worst times, right? And we sort of go, yeah, that's a great idea. We walk right into that. Hey, man, Jesus came to take care of the stupid. He came to take care of even your worst decisions. He can redeem that. Again, that's why... You're not disqualified. Whatever you've done, there's still the story still continues. Embrace the Savior and the Rescuer. Let me read to I mean, here's a summary of Jesus' life, John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him, means trusts, will not perish, die. But have, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Yet God did not hold anything back for our rescue. And I often joke, but I say, man, this world is sure lucky that God didn't ask me to give up one of my kids for you. Uh, good luck. You're not getting mine. You know, I don't know. How do you do that? But God held nothing back. Again, because of his love, the value that he has for us. And so what I'd like to do is, again, it's Christmas. It's all about the, the Savior has arrived, the rescuer for us. Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about basically the results of it. What happens in this rescue? And the first three verses are all about man. They're all man-centered. Basically saying, you've messed up, you're stuck in your sin, you, you, we, we messed up, we messed up bad, okay? And it says we're dead, is what the passage says. No hope. But here's where it gets really good, Verses starting in verse 4. But God. And whenever you read a passage in the Bible that says, but God, that's always a good thing. Because it means, but God showed up. But God intercepted you. God was at work. But God did an action. God did something. And he changes it. But God is so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much I mean, he's so compassionate he, he was moved when he looks at us and he saw we needed help and rescuing that we can't be that good he says even though we were dead because of our sin dead means like there's no relationship with God it is broken, severed because of stuff that we have between us and him he gave, his, or he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it says it's only by God's grace you've been saved. There's three, three verbs in this verse and the next verse. I just want to show it. It's really cool because in English we can somehow miss out. But it's written with the, it has a prefix on it. And for example, in this verse, right in the middle it says he gave us life. That literally means he made us alive together. There's a prefix on that means together, which is implying be, we are together with Jesus. Like positionally, you are together with Jesus. Just as Jesus was made alive, you are made alive with Jesus. Then um, verse 6, two more ver verbs here. He raised us from the dead along with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. The raise us from the dead literally means you've been raised up together with Jesus. The other one, seated us, literally means 
sit down together with Jesus. Now, obviously, that's not physically, but here's what it's saying is that positionally, just as you can count sure, if you believe Jesus is alive, he came back to life, he was resurrected, and he's now seated, at having a sit, a seat next to God at the throne of this world, you can be that sure that it is for you also. Just as you count on that for, I mean, that's the foundation of our faith of what Jesus, if Jesus didn't come back to life, let's go home. Now, I will go to the beach, freeze, but let's, like, there's no reason to be here. Jesus came back to life, and that's what changes the story for us. Not a baby, but his life, and then he, li- he fulfilled the God's purpose, came back to life, proving he's not like us. And, and what Paul is saying in here is just as he raised Jesus from the, again, the, the, because of that prefix, the together with, he's raised us together with Jesus. He seated us together with Jesus. Meaning just as, again, it's, it just blows my mind. Jesus has authority, right? I mean, like, he's it. He's sitting at this throne next to God the Father. And what Paul is trying to write out is that because of the transformation that's happened to us, and the fact that Jesus took care of our sin, we are considered that righteous. Like, there's nothing being held against us. The fact that Jesus has the authority to sit there, in a sense, we do too. Now, we can't take that too far. I mean, at least I'm not able to go there yet. But it's, Paul is emphasizing that what is true of Christ is true of us because of what Christ has done. Does that make sense? Now, here's what's really cool. The word seated there, it means literally to settle down and dwell. You're not just... Here, you know, if you probably had someone at some point, you were tired and like, oh, we ha- have a seat for a moment. Just rest your legs for a moment. That's not what this means. It means you're putting roots down, like you're settling down. Get comfortable, because this is, this is like your new home. This is where you belong. And that's what Paul's trying to communicate to this church here in Ephesus, going, sure, you know you mess up. You know you say things and do things, and you, you, you want to do over so many times. But here's the truth. Jesus has so completed his work in you. Get comfortable. You're with Christ. It is done deal. It's not based on what we've done, but on Christ and, and that. All right, verse 7. Uh, this is a great verse. Because of all this, God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible, the incredible wealth of his grace and his kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. You see that that phrase, incredible wealth? That means over the top. Like, you didn't just scrape out a few pennies. Like, you had plenty to pay for. You know, if you're a baseball player, you didn't just hit it out out of the field. You hit it out of the park. Like, it is over the top. The prefix word there is hyper. So it's beyond what was even needed or necessary. God's faithfulness, his grace is abundant for us. Like we don't ever have to worry. God, can you really do this? I know I don't deserve it. His love, favor, value is for us so much, it's over the top. And I love where it says that he can point to us as examples. You know, that means you're like God's trophy. You know, try to imagine this conversation. God's have, almost having to prove he's, he's good, he's faithful, and he's capable, and he can handle things. God could go, look at this guy. Remember this guy? And he's pointing at us, or you know, me, and he's like, remember what he was like? He was such a knucklehead. He did this and this and this, and they, he just couldn't help. He was stuck with this. And Look at him now. Like, th- you and I are examples of God's over-the-top grace and value and of how he's transformed us. That's it. You know, there's a, you got certain things that you'll, you use often, but then you got that top shelf kind of stuff, right? That's where you put the special things. Like, no one's touching this, right? That's you. You're the over-the-top value. God's done some amazing things to make you different. You're, you're on the top shelf. That's his, his feelings, his love, his value towards us. <clears throat> I love it. And then it says here, verse 8, God saved you. By his grace when you believed or through your faith because you trusted him. You just simply said, okay, God, I'm going to go with what you say. And it says, you can't take credit for it. It's a gift. 
Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. You know why? We're not that good. And it says so that none of us can boast about it. And the whole point is God is the gift. You know, when you give a gift to someone, certainly now, if you're a kid, you like get crazy because it's a Tonka truck or whatever your toy is that you got really crazy about. But you always know that the gift is literally an extension from, of the giver, right? Sure, the gift is nice. Sure, it's going to be fun or useful. But it really comes down to who is the giver? Because they're the ones expressing their value, that you're, you're worth it. And so I'm giving it to you. Again, it, it shows the heart of the giver. I mean, unless they're a manipulator and they're trying to do something wrong, but obviously that's not the story or picture of God. But you're so valued. God said, I will give you over the top what you need to change you. That's me. That's just who I am. It's the gift and the giver of it. And let me just say this. It's not about how faithful you are. Though it says it's by grace because of your faith, your trust, it's not based on our faith even. It's all about God's grace. We've got to respond to it and go, okay, God, I want that. I, I trust you. I'm believing you. But it's not like, did you have enough faith? Like, you either do or you don't. It's like being pregnant. You either are or you're not, right? There's no levels of pregnancy. You're either transferred in Christ or you're not. You either are or you are, you're not. And so that's why it's not about our performance. Are we good enough? It's, are you in Christ? Have you trusted me? And it doesn't even t require much, but just go, you're the best shot I got. God, Jesus, I trust you. And that's what makes a difference. Let's look at our last verse here. This is good. Verse 10. It says, we, you and I, we are God's masterpiece. That's you. Like God is creating a one-of-a-kind, unique, amazing, priceless masterpiece in your life. You're not ordinary. You're not one of the many. You're unique. It says he's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. This is what masterpieces do. They, they're something specific that they do. They, they go to specific show. I mean, they, they have a purpose, unique than anything else. And what Paul is trying to write out here is that you are unique. You're not an ordinary. You're God special. And, and in this specialness, this creation that he's redone in you and, and made in you, there's a specific purpose. And it's unique. We all have our things to do and you know, you could be an attorney, and some people think, well, you know, my purpose for my life is I'm going to be an attorney because I'm really good at argumenting or, or whatever, you know, convincing others and laying my case out. But they're still trying to do it without God. And though that may be their natural gifting, man, when we put God in there and we seek what is God's purpose for my life, it changes everything. And regardless of what career you have or what you do with your time, when you add Christ into it, when you're fulfilling his purposes, that's what changes, what's fulfilling, but it, it's even what makes it beneficial in fulfilling what God has for you, the very best. You know, I remember when Charlene and I, when Spring was real little, our daughter, who just turned 15 this week. Yeah, so we're doing all the driving stuff in preparation. God forgive me. <laughs> all right. Uh, um, when she was really little, yeah, we would always say, babe, you're beautiful. No, I, we laugh because, like, our daughter was born with, like, no hair. You know, I mean, to third grade, no hair. <laughs> she was just really thin and, and the hair and all that. And, and, but we kept saying, baby, you're beautiful. Baby, you're so beautiful. And one day I overheard her talking to mommy. She said, I'm beautiful. And I thought, oh, no, what did I create? Oh, Lord, well, you know, is it ego? What is this? Oh, no, it's going to be one of those kids in class. I don't want to have that kid. But then it, I, I realized that, that wasn't where she was going with it. She was literally just simply believing what I told her. She's beautiful. Inside now, baby, you're beautiful. And, and I was really speaking to her identity. She's just saying what's true. Man, that was a moment for me because I, you know what that led to? Imagine this. How different would this world be if Christians 
really believe what God said in his word. Like our attitude would be different, wouldn't it? Like this world, the planet would be different if we really believe God. Let me ask you, how would your life be if you truly believed God's word and what he said? Instead of saying, man, I'm so stupid. Oh, I can't believe it happened. Or I'm so fabulous. You know, again, we all have our different thing. But what if we really believe what God said about us? We wouldn't be as distracted by the stupid or the shiny or the other things that the world calls success. One last verse. Luke one thirty seven. Nothing is impossible with God. You know, that's, that's a truth we need to embrace. Regardless of what's happening in your life at this moment, nothing is impossible with God. He's fulfilling his purpose. Just don't mess it up. Like, don't fight against it. Don't try to wrestle it away from him. Just let him work it out. Always remember, if you're in the story, you're not at the end of the story. Right? God's still at work in us. Nothing is impossible with God. He's still fulfilling his story in us. I, what I'd like to do is just give you three applications. Again, the truth of Christmas that the Savior came how? What are some ways that we can make this real in our life? First one is, let me just say this. Don't surrender to the culture's enticing call. Right? Don't give in to the materialism and all the stuff. And this, again, remember the first list? Stress and anxiety and fear and all this stuff. Don't buy into it. What I literally had to do, again, man, my whole thing, I, I, I get distracted with shiny new technology stuff, especially if it has a little Apple on it. I love Apple things, okay? <laughs> and so what I would find myself doing is like, man, Sunday paper was like, I'm going to have quiet time for the rest of the week, man, because I got all these things. I got Best Buy at that time, Circuit City, remember that place? And, you know, all these places that had stuff, things you plug in. I get to, like, worship at this, you know, my quiet time, looking through all the pictures and reading everything. And, um, you know, if I, I would leave there and go, oh, I'm frustrated with what I got. With, and, by the way, what I had was, like, fine, right? But it wasn't the new. It wasn't the shiniest. It wasn't the fastest. And I began to realize that, for me, I just had to quit looking at that anymore. Again, Sunday paper is not as big of a deal as it used to be, but I need to make sure like, I'm not like zoned out online and just looking at all the new stuff because I can look for the new stuff when I need the new stuff. Don't need the new stuff, right? I can look at Best Buy when I need to buy something that will be the Best Buy, but I don't need to do it every week. And again, that was just something for me because I just, it's easy to get caught into the distracted by the shiny and the fast and the stuff. So don't get stuck in your stuff. That's just a distraction. The second point here is that, man, reconnect with the true significance of what Christmas is. You know, it, it's about the Savior, the rescuer. And it's all about the relationship. Make sure you're in the good place with him. You know, re remind yourself. Christmas is all about, remember what Isaiah said, we will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. Remind yourself God's with you. Jesus, the name of, you know what said, you will call him Jesus, for he will save the world from their sin. Remind yourself, Jesus is the rescuer. He has rescued me. Stay that, say that. Exclamation point, past tense, he has rescued me. Remind yourself of what he's done in your life. And again, be thankful for it because he rescues us, frees us, saves us, changes, transforms us. That's the whole point of Christmas. And um, I encourage you, man, be involved in your church family. If, if, if we're it, be a part of this. Man, come next week. Next week's going to be great. We have Rachel, the lady who led our worship last week. She'll be here, and she's bringing the keyboard player. And I know for this service, we'll have all, the whole band together. And it'll be fun. And if you come to first service, it'll be Rachel, and they'll sing the hymns on the keyboard. It'll be, I think, really good. But regardless, we need to be around, reminded where what God has done, that he's rescued us. 
Um, also, too, Christmas Eve service. We're having, just to let you know, we're having our two normal services in the morning because Christmas Eve is on Sunday this year. So 9.30 and 11, and then we're going to have a special service that evening at 11 o'clock. It'll be our candlelight service, and it'll be a great time. Last, again, don't get stuck in the stuff. Focus on what Christmas really is, and that's a relationship with God. Second is be generous in your relationships with others. You know, when we focus on others, that changes everything. A couple ways. Um, you know, if you're at a drive through pay for the person behind you. Just do something, something to show generosity, and you don't have to make a big deal about what well, we can do that. That shows that God's really at work in us. When we can do that, and we're not looking for applause or recognition, I'm going to go against just that and, and tell you, Charlie and I were having dinner with our family uh, Friday night, modest place, you know, no big deal. Um, <clears throat> but a, a single mom came in. It was just evident. She's wearing, like, scrubs, so she works in the medical office. She had a little guy who was about six or seven, and it was just so neat to see her. She's trying to engage, and, you know, it's the end of the day. She's trying to reconnect with her son and see how school's been. And, but even now and then, she'd sort of look away, and you could tell she's sort of lost in thought. And then she'd come back and try to engage, and, and I don't know what it was, but my heart just broke. And I thought, man, that's a got to be a single mom. There was no ring or anything. And if you're a single mom, you're a superhero. But I don't know how you do it. But you're amazing. And uh, my heart just went out, and I just said to Sean, I said, we got to we gotta take care of her. You know, let's surprise her. You know, and so we just got to give, told her a way to give, gave her a gift card and all that. And again, I know, the Bible says when you do stuff, do it in secret. Don't do it for the applause. And so I just lost that blessing by telling you. But here's why I'm saying this. Not, not to put myself up, but to tell you, like, God is faithful for me to live out the very same thing <laughs> that I'm teaching to you. And I'm in the, I'm in, you and I, we're in the same place. You know, we go to God for what he wants us to do. So there are not different rules for the clergy and you guys. Like, we're together, right? We're all followers of Christ. And, and that's the only reason why I say that. But, man, when we can learn to be generous to others, and it doesn't have to be big, but just so we're not focused on ourselves, um, it changes things. And it just, you know, if you're sensitive, ask, ask God for the opportunities that you can do that. You know, what one way would be uh, honor God in, in giving here. You know, for some of you, you know, you're not a regular giver, and I want to encourage you to do that. I, I promise you, you know, when you get to the point and you say, you know, when I get my check for whatever income I get, you know, I, wa I want to be, I want to give God first fruits. That's the principle, first fruit. You know, the first check we want to give is to the Lord because there's a whole biblical principle there. But it's the idea that you're honoring God first. And, you know, I think God's going to give bigger blessings than your Visa card or Duke Electric or whoever else you pay in. If Scripture talks about paying God first, you know, I, I want his blessing on my life. And, you know, <clears throat> when you go to a restaurant, if the service is good, you give a tip, right? And you determine what it is, often based on your, how you felt like your experience went. Too many people treat God like that. Like, well, if we had a good week, you know, I might give him a tip. You know, here's 10 or 20 bucks or something. And... You know, don't treat God that way. Because here's the truth. God is faithful. He's good. Whether it's a good week or a bad week, here's the truth. Even in the bad weeks, God is still using that in his purpose to be at work in us. So it's getting, giving, biblical giving is all about acknowledging the Lord in it. So, a little bit of a rabbit trail there. But generosity, I think, is the, the character that best reflects God, especially at Christmas. There's many opportunities. God will be faithful to allow us to walk through that. Listen, this culture's really done a pretty ugly thing with Christmas in some ways because they've gotten away from the Christ of it. You want Jesus to be your story changer? Always put him at the center of the story because he's the one that affected it and changed it. Right. Please bow your heads. I just try to create a little bit of privacy here, and I just want to say, Man, for some of you, you want to experience Christmas like never before, receive God's gift 
in Jesus. You know, we read all these things that Jesus has done, the forgiveness of our sin, that he's changed us. And he has extravagance waiting for us as far as joy and peace, even in the difficult, struggling, challenging times of our life. We can see the realness of the Savior. And his grace is sufficient for all of your needs, and it's available to all. And I'm just encouraging, man, would you make Jesus the story changer in your life? Let's do it now. Just say, dear God, I, I acknowledge Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. That's what the Bible says. God, I even really know what all that means, but he's calling me to say, embrace him, to trust him with my life. And Jesus, I'm trusting you. I'm asking you to, to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to give me a new direction for my life. I'm asking you to help me make the right decision. I'm asking you to, you know what, fix my circumstances. Let me understand what you want to do, but Lord, let me allow you to do what you want to do in me. Change me. And maybe you've prayed that already. Your prayer is like mine. God, I don't want to be distracted by what this culture has done. And I want to, Jesus, I want you to be the true focus of this Christian season, the arrival of the Savior. And God, I want to show that by being generous, by serving, serving here at my church or in other ways. How can I serve others? Because God, that best reflects you. Lord, thank you for your gift. I want to change your life forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing this closing song. If you've made a decision of any kind spiritually, man, we'd love to know about it. You could take that connection card and just check the back or something or write it out. We'd love to know about it, all right? And you can put it in the generosity boxes. But thanks, Johnny. Yep. I invite you guys to, to stand as we sing our last song together in praise to the Lord.
Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. Your love. Let me pray over you a prayer blessing. Father, this week, Lord, may we walk with a strong assurance and reminder that you're with us. You have saved us and rescued us. Father, that changes everything. Thank you for intercepting our life and changing our story. That, Father, now, because of your change of heart in us, Lord, we can not be distracted and get caught up in the stuff. And, Father, instead, we can just celebrate you, the Savior, and that, oh, we can be even generous, serving others, blessing them, surprising them. Lord, may we take 100% what you say in your word to be truth. Lord, may we live that out. Thank you for changing us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a great week, guys.